And uh, if you are a guest here with us, my name's Dave Overhold, lead pastor here at Church on the Rock. And you came at a good time. You came at a good time because we are, uh, we are starting a new series here. And you can sort of jump in there at, at the beginning. And before we, uh, we do, this is sort of going to be our summer series, our summer series. So uh, I, I'd love you to sort of go, this is our, our start, sort of the jump off point. And I'd love you to be able to get in the Word through this whole summer. I know that you are off on vacations on different places, and uh, just my heart aches for my people to get into the Word of God and just enjoy it and, and uh, yeah, love it so much. So we have two things at the back table. First of all, we've had uh, one of our fantastic volunteers, Cheryl, and she has uh, spent the last four weeks going and making this devotional for you. And it is fantastic. Uh, just a little bit of background over, over every passage, a couple questions. And you can probably do a devotional up to, you know, 10, 15 minutes. But it will feed you all through the summer, and you'll be able to track with us all through the summer. So make sure you pick up one of these and uh, for, the, for the wonderful, huge cost of nothing, all right? So, yeah, yeah. So make sure you get that. And also... I know I, last, uh, last year, um, I think Francesco said, Dave, in his wonderful Italian accent, he said, Dave, do you have, we're going on a road trip. And uh, we'd just be able to, uh, love to be able to get into, uh, you know, listen to some good things. So I said, listen, often here at Church on the Rock, we'll pick one character in the Bible and sort of follow their life through. So Tina has spent the last uh, about three weeks copying some of our series that we've done in the past on the life of David, the life of Nehemiah, the life of uh, Joshua, and the life of Esther. So if you're going on a road trip and you're going, wow, you know, what do we have to, to look forward to? Why don't you pick up one of those, and we're going to ask you just to pay for the cost of the CDs. But uh, if you, I just want our people to get into the Word of God through this, uh, this, uh, this summer. So uh, let, I, I'm just going to put that down. That's my one little advertisement. Uh, I'm going to pray uh, just because I just love to talk to Jesus. And then uh, let's, uh, let's jump into his Word. Heavenly Father, I love that song, Light, Glorious Light, and that's who you are. What a great song that we need you. As dads, we admit that readily. readily. We need you. And so, Father, we're going to look at somebody in the scriptures that uh, leaned heavily on you. And, uh, Father, I, I just pray that you would teach us through your word. Teach us as a community. Teach us as we worship after the message, as we come to the communion table, as we pray for each other, as, as, as this community becomes an alive organism that, that spurs each other on to love and good deeds. Lord, I pray that this will be a, a really good jump-off point for this whole summer in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm not sure if you've ever met somebody that uh, you, you know that you'd like. Often I'll, I'm put into a situation, I'll go and speak somewhere, and there's a group of people, and I'm kind of nervous. I am, <laughs> there's a little shy part of me, there is a big introvert part of me that would like to go and hide in a corner, but I'm there to, to be able to go and say hi to people, so I walk around and say hi, and I scan the room, and there's some nice dressed people, and sometimes there's power people. You just see how they're talking. They're leaning in, and they're using hands, and I'm just saying, they're just scary. <laughs> I can, I'll spend the whole week just not getting to know them, and there's some people that just look so perfect, that, you know, and just, and they carry themselves with such perfection. <laughs> this one woman, not one hair out of place, and she came up and addressed us, and I'm going, who are you really? And and then every so often I see somebody real over there. And I go, man, I'd like to get to know them. They, seem, they just seem so real and they seem so open. I love to do that. So as I look through different biblical figures, I sort of say, what would it be fun? Do you ever do this game? Like where would you like to be transported back and see, right? I kind of, my, one of my heroes is King David. King David rocks. I think he's really fun. Okay, he stumbled over the rock a little bit. But anyway... He still is a really cool guy. But, you know, if I met him, if I sort of showed up as ordinary Joe along the side, I think I would be a little bit intimidated by this national leader, uh, war, uh, you know, uh, here, military hero. If I met Daniel, I, I, he just kept on rising to the top, being this organizational genius. And uh, me, I'm, I'm an organizational genius. <coughs> Once in a while... 
So I would be very intimidated by him. <laughs> but I, Moses, I've gotten to love him. Not because he is pristine, a military hero, a natural leader that's going to push everyone over. <laughs> you know what I like about him? He's us. <laughs> He's this reluctant leader. He feels very unable at first, feels very unqualified. He feels so unqualified. Even his brother and sister say, well, why him? Like, God speaks to us too. He's not that great of a leader. And I could just, you know, he's called the most humble guy. He's just the humble guy. He takes it again and again. Poof, poof. He just, yeah. Sometimes I have those feelings often. No, often I have those feelings. I'll come into this church and go, wow, God, there's, far, there's people far more qualified to be a pastor than I am. Uh, there are, I go and speak places, and I just, I'm, I'm hitting the airplane, and I'm going, why me, God? I, you know, I'm this guy that loves Jesus, and wow, how come me? And, and I just get that from Moses, this reluctant leader that said, okay, I'll do what you ask me to do. Um, I discovered that he's a heart guy. He's all this passion rolled up in a person. You see, he's passionate even in his mistakes where his sin, where he goes off and kills an Egyptian because it's just his passion just sort of wells up in his heart. And, and then he gets thrown out into the desert and he sees some women being mistreated so his heart bleeds for them. He doesn't go into the mistreatment. He just goes and helps them. His, his, heart, his heart makes him afraid to go and talk to Pharaoh. And as God is about to say, I've had it enough with these people. And if I was Moses, I'd be saying that too. And God says, okay, I'm going to have a whole new plan. I'm going to start a new nation with you. And wouldn't that be weird if Moses said, sure, let's go for it. We would have a different Bible today. <laughs> but he didn't. Moses' heart, he gets down and intercedes for his people. No, no, you, you got to help these people. I just see this big heart guy. And because he understands his inadequacies, he just trusts God. You'll, you, we're going to meet somebody that trusts God again and again and again. He trusts God to cross the Red Sea. He asks for heavenly food, even for meat. He is probably one of the best prayers in the Old Testament. That's <laughs> interesting. Uh, he, God says, I'm going to give you a sign that I am with you. And if I was Moses, I'd be leaning in, okay, what's the sign? And he says, you will worship me when you get through this whole thing at this mountain. Wow, you mean I have to obey first before I get the sign? <laughs> yep, <laughs> yep. So he trusts God, and you'll see that he's a growing man. He's not the same man that started at the burning bush. And you're going to see somebody that grows into faith in a cool way. I remember when uh, Carr was very small, uh, we were trying to save money, and so we bought a jacket that was um, about five ages too big for her. <laughs> it was a really cool jacket. And I remember it, it was actually running on the ground, you know, and we rolled up the sleeves, and we figured we got three winters out of it, and we did. We got three winters out of it. It was amazing. <laughs> and she eventually grew into it. She looked very foolish and got, that's why her psyche's a little hurt, but... That, to me, is what Moses is like. He grows into this faith that God is taking him into. So if you want somebody, if you want an ordinary guy that says, I'm going to trust God. If you, you want to learn how to trust God, come along for the ride this summer. We're going to learn how to trust God together. We're going to learn how to grow together and not, not run away from massive, massive things that we're being asked to do. And then I see one of the most intimate relationships with God in the whole Old Testament. He sees God face to face. We're going to find out he eats with God face to face. I'm not sure what that's like. wonder what God ordered. But they just were together. The smoke came down on the mountain. The mountain was quaking, and all the people were running away saying, No! Moses. I'm going to do this. I'm going to meet with God face to face. There's this thing called the tent of meeting we're going to get to know, where actually God shows up. And you find out where does Moses hang out? Hangs out at the tent of meeting. 
Because he just loves to hang out with God. So we're going to find out through this whole summer the story of an ordinary guy that maybe feels very inadequate at times. But he steals himself and God grows him into this faith where he trusts God, trusts God, and miracles happen. Huge miracles happen. (laughs) So let's get started. Uh, the first little story is about um, Abraham. Abraham was, going, uh, was called from Ur, and he, God wanted him to start a new community. So he goes by Canaan, and he says, I'm going to give this to your family eventually. And Abraham's great-grandson goes to Egypt, Joseph. And Joseph was famous there as he turned all of uh, Egypt, saved all of Egypt. Now, by the time Moses, Egypt was a world power already for 3,000 years. Isn't that wild? Already, it's, you know how, you know, United States is, you know, one of the world's powers, mega powers, right? Well, how long have they been doing that? A couple hundred years, that's it. (laughs) Egypt, 3,000 years. The the, the pyramids that we see had already been built a 1,000 years earlier. This was like this huge dynasties that continued to roll along. And all of a sudden, there's this pharaoh called Hyksos. Who, who all of a sudden started to see this growing number of people. And he said, listen, I, I'm, going to, I, I'm worried about them because they live on the edge of my, my kingdom. And if a, a roaming army comes in, they'll pick up those people and use them as soldiers. So I, we're going we're gonna to put the brakes on things. So he drove them into slavery. It's, you know, it's fascinating. Our, they, they have discovered what they were building. Isn't that wild? The, the, you know, in archaeology, they have discovered what buildings they were building. And they were built, the Jewish people were building two whole cities. They would make a whole city of storehouses just to storehouse the grain. And so uh, one was called Pitmon, and the other one is called Broom Hill as they, they're, they're discovering it, as they're still tearing it all apart. And so they drove them into slavery. But guess what? They just had more babies. Reminds me of Church on the Rock. <laughs> they just had more babies. And so they said, what are we going to do? And so now the Pharaoh said, now a Pharaoh that came that didn't know Joseph said, listen, I'm going to choose male genocide because if I can kill all the males when the army comes through, not only will it lessen the population, there won't be an army for them to pick up. And so if we can kill the males, we are going to lessen the army. So he told the midwives to, if you see a male baby, to kill the the male baby. But the midwives, it says they feared God more than Pharaoh. Which is fascinating. Over 400 years since Joseph was was there. And over those years, they continued to have these threads of faith through their lives that they still feared God instead of Pharaoh. And so Pharaoh could see that this was not working at all. And so he just said, listen, anybody, anybody that comes across a male baby of the Israelites, throw it into the Nile. Throw that thing into the Nile. And the thing is, in uh, areas of the Nile, they're just known for a lot of crocodiles. So this is, uh, don't let your imagination run, but that's what he was doing. They were wanting to kill as many. So basically, you could walk through the town and hear a baby cry, and you're allowed by the king to go and check it out if it's a male, and then you can go and grab that that little, little baby and throw it in. So in the midst of this, in the midst of being oppressed in slavery, in the midst of this male genocide that was coming around them, we come to our passage we're going to look at today. And it's fascinating, just letting you know, parents, moms and dads, that our kids in Kids Rock are going through Moses through the whole summer. We did that for a reason. Just putting that out there. <laughs> okay, here we go. Exodus 2, 1-4. Now, a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. Funny, we, we don't know their names here. The woman conceived and bore a son. When she saw that he was beautiful, ah, oh, which mother would not say that, right? <laughs> wow, he is so beautiful. She hid him for three months. Could you imagine that? Okay, baby owners, I mean parents. Hiding your baby for three, at first it's cute, like you can, you know, be on the quiet level, right? Oh man, be quiet, somebody else is coming through, and you know, you'd have some of the neighbors standing in front of the door. You just imagine all that was going around, and there's somebody down the road that, that, that made sandals better than you, and they knew that you were pregnant, and they'd come by to see, it was, you know, you could just imagine the tension in the town, and so they had to hide this little baby for three months, 
But when she could hide him no longer. Now, I love it in the Bible when there's just one phrase. And you know that phrase means so much more, don't you? There's somebody, somebody. It was not going to work. This was not going to be. Imagine the decision of these parents. The, the heart pounding. It's, they're coming for him. And so, they could hide him no longer. She got a wicker basket, covered it over in tar and pitch. Uh, and then she put the child uh, in, set it amongst the reeds in the bank of the Nile. Wow. Then I, my guess is his sister stood at a distance to find out what happened to him. His sister is Miriam. We're going to find out a lot about Miriam as we go. But what a faith risk. What a faith risk. G- giving the, your child to say, God, I believe you have some special plan for this little one. So I'm going to take the risk. I'm not, not going to let them take him away. I'm going to hide, hide. Now I'm going to go. And, and we're going to set him off, let him go. But also my, my daughter is going to go and follow and see what's going on. The daughter of the Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile with her maidens alongside the Nile. Now, this is a little phrase. Again, this, once you understand what's happening here, you start to find out the wonder of the story. They had bathing pools for uh, the royalty, so she really didn't need to go and bathe in the Nile. So people are wondering, why is she bathing at the Nile? They, they believed at the time that the Nile was the place of life. Real life came from the Nile. And they believed that there were healing properties in the Nile, and particularly for fertility. So if you were could not have a child, you would go to the Nile and in a little safe pool bathe in the Nile. Picture this. There's normal people up and down the aisle, Nile, but, but now the maidens you know, form this little you know, foul next of, of, of this daughter of Pharaoh. And she's going to go to one of these healing pools to be hopefully... After she bathes, gets, get to get a baby. Where's her heart's all about? She's all, baby, baby, going to get my baby. She goes down into Nile, and what, what happens? She saw a basket amongst the reeds, sent her maiden. She brought it to her, and when she opened it, saw a child. Behold, the boy was crying. Ha ha, God even made the baby cry at the right time. <laughs> she had pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. And his sister, that would be Miriam, said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse a child for you? That's awesome. How close she was following that little basket down. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go ahead. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Wow. (laughs) There had to be tears on that one, hadn't there? Mom, mom, he's safe, he's safe. A Pharaoh's daughter has her. <gasps> so, what happens? Uh, so the, then the Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take the child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you wages. Wow. Moms, I bet you wish that could, could happen right now. <laughs> so the woman took the child and nursed him. The child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. You think maybe two or three years Hmm. She named him Moses. Interesting. It was an Egyptian name because he, uh, I drew him out of the water. So I'm not sure if you can see the backstory of this. It doesn't take much insight to see it, does it? That in the midst of this horrible situation where their worlds were falling apart and they're saying, what do we do? They take a small step of faith and say, God, take care of this. We're going to hide our, my, my son. We're, we're going to send him off. In the midst of this, God did not forget his promise to his people against overwhelming odds. God does his next thing for this child. He arranged the Pharaoh's daughter to come down and had just the right moment for her to look for a child, to have pity on this child. I don't know what if, if she was the rebellious daughter of Pharaoh because she didn't turn him in. I don't know. She used the little rebel. But anyway, somehow God arranged this whole story. And now we have a story of a life of miracles. Can I just say, I still believe God does miracles. Flat out. Um, and, and I know we don't know when, why he doesn't at times. 
We know when we get to heaven, we'll figure it out, and the miracle of forever life will take care of any other miracle that you might be wanting. <laughs> but I've seen financial miracles. I've seen healing miracles. God is the God of the impossible. And I think he breaks through and tells us in little ways that he, I am the God of the impossible. And even in a horrible world that we live in, he reminds us of this. And so this miracle happens. I heard a kid, about a kid about telling a story of the Red Sea to his dad. And, uh, you know, the dad said, so, so what did you learn in Sunday school? And the kid said, well, well, Moses came up to the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army was right behind him. So he uh, got pontoon boats coordinated, shipped to shore radios, and uh, they made a cross. And then the uh, destroyers came in, and, uh, and uh, with that and stealth bombers blew up the Pharaoh's army. Uh, and they made it to the other side. <laughs> and the dad said, is that what the teacher really said? <laughs> and the little guy said, no, but if I told you what she said, you'd never believe it. <laughs> 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 this is the God we serve, the God of miracles, <laughs> the God of miracles. And so, Dave, you say, Dave, what, 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 what's, what are we going to get from this? Can I say this? There's these things in all our lives, not just Moses' life, all our lives. I believe God makes sovereign foundations. Sovereign, he is king, and he weaves life stories. God makes deposits in your childhood. God has a race for you to run. He has already set it out, and he has, he has given you some of the, your family, your race, your, your background, even how you look. He has, he has arranged all that because he has something for you to do. I, 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 I just, I so believe it. It's one of these, just so happened the daughter of Pharaoh was desperate for a child. Just so happened she was willing to re rebel. Just so happened that Moses was brought up in the Pharaoh's home. Just so happened that Moses would learn the language. He would be, model, he would be uh, listening to a model of a world leader. Just so happened he would be raised beside a brother we don't know how well he knew them, but the Pharaoh that he comes to and says, let my people go, he was also raised in the court. So somehow, people think they might have known each other. There are some things that God just arranged perfectly so Moses could do what he wanted him to do. I was reading a book by a person called Robert Clinton, and he talks about the making of a leader. He said, in the great leaders that he has sort of looked at their biographies, he always sees that there's something from childhood that God takes from that bucket and uses for our lives now. I got thinking about that. I'm thinking, what did God ever do with me when I was a kid? And I remember my sisters tell me that I was one of those blonde-headed kids. Though, you know, have you ever seen the, not just the blonde-headed kid, but the white blonde-headed kid? That was me. I had this little baby face. I got beat up lots, <laughs> a little, little tiny guy. I was not, uh, I was not your, your, big, uh, your big leader when I was a kid. But my, and, and they said I was so quiet that, uh, that they're worried whether I could speak or not. That's what they said. <laughs> my sister said, even when we're, you know, we're, we're eating around the table, I would say nothing. And then my parents said, do you need some ketchup? I would shake my head. I wouldn't even say yes. <laughs> They'd pass it over. And they're worried whether I would actually be able to vocalize. <laughs> my dad is a magician. So he said, Dave, you're going to be my magician's assistant. Great. So he forced me to stand on stage since I was eight years old. Go figure. We had to go and load up his old station wagon. You don't know what a station wagon looks like. Look it up on Google. But we would put in speakers, sound speakers. We would put in curtains. We would put in rabbit cages and dove cages. We would go to one show and unload the car, load up the show, and then do it, pack it up, load up the car, and do it again. We do that sometimes four times a Saturday. There's something about loading equipment in and out of a car I was just brought up in. Remember starting this church. Well, we can't do it. We have to load things in. I got a car. <laughs> Weird, huh? And then I always listened to my dad. He would get, do these magic tricks that uh, were just fun. 
and uh, he would always give a gospel illustration about it. He didn't, he didn't have a lot of different Bible stories. He just kind of did the gospel. In fact, every time we went out, we probably, I heard the gospel presented at least six times. We did four shows uh, over a Saturday. I would hear the gospel 24 times. If we did that several weekends of the year, I would hear the gospel approximately 250 times a year. And I did that since I was eight years old. If you wonder why the gospel is important to me, <laughs> there's these sovereign foundations in my life. I could never have guessed that I would be you know, stuck on a stage loading things in and out for most of my life and telling the gospel. Who would have thunk it, huh? But guess what? God has done the very same thing for all of you. I don't believe it's just me and Moses. I believe he has things in our past that God will use. Uh, Helen, my, my wife, uh, uh, she would tell me that she was forced to go to German school. Oh, German school. <laughs> Yuck. <laughs> Can't tell you the number of German people she's stopped and prayed with over these last few years as they, you know, we go camping. I bet you they're German. Yeah, and wow, there she's praying with them again. <laughs> then my poor daughter. It started off as giving my wife a break, so I'd take her with me to youth, uh, youth retreats in diapers. I'd, we'd be doing youth ministry, and they'd, she'd pass them up and down the aisle. <laughs> you, you, she, you know, they'd pass her all around. And uh, I'd not realizing that she was in training for youth ministry since she was two. <laughs> you know, it's not just the good stuff. Moses, I'm not sure if you realize, was adopted into an evil religion into sensual practices. And the power there was so abusive. I, I remember seeing a picture of Cleopatra, and she would bring in slaves, and she would give them different kinds of poisons because she wanted to see how they would die just in front of She was just interested in how the effects of it. It was just an evil, evil place that Moses was brought up in. And the thing is, God could even take evil from your past and turn it for good. I love Isaiah 61.3. It says that God is going to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. You think your past is all in ashes. God says, no, no, I'm going to wipe those ashes away. I'm going to give you a beautiful crown, oil of joy instead of mourning. And, and some people seem to be so stuck in their past. But, but my brother took his life. But I was abused, and I, and I know you will always have scars. You don't have to have wounds. God can take that and turn it for good. I've seen so many people hurt in the past that God, just like Moses, unsure, unknown, taking a baby step, helping comfort someone else in that situation. First Corinthians chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 talks about that. That God comforts us in our pain so that we can comfort others with the same comfort we've received. And sometimes God can take that and mold that and make that into something beautiful. A garment of praise instead of spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness. The unmovable. If you've had a past has been hurt, guess what? God can turn it around and speak new truth into that. And you will become an oak, a stable, stable planting. A planting for the Lord to display his splendor through you. Listen, God makes deposits in your childhood. Use them well. Let me tell you, so let's get even more practical. At the end of this uh, sermon... I'm going to ask you actually to thank God for his deposits in your life. I want you to think through what they are. Can you think through what they are? Can you ask God right now, what deposits did you put in my life from a, a, a family that was on the way to God? What, what was it? Is it biblical knowledge maybe that they just kept on giving you and giving you? And maybe that is a deposit that God is going to use for so many people. And some of the things that you might have even hated in your childhood. God can take it and turn for good. <laughs> I, I hated my face when I was a teenager. I hated my face. And mostly how oh, teenagers are, you know. Uh, I, remember, I had this baby face. I had those red cheeks thing, you know. 
And all my friends that had one day's growth, you know, and they, they had this beard, and all the girls would go, oh. <laughs> you know, they're wondering if I'm still in grade five. No, I'm, I'm 15. <laughs> Man, I remember looking at that thinking God made some mistake. And somebody took me aside when I was a full 16 years old. And, and they, they told me, Dave, you must hate God. I go, I don't hate God. I like God. No, you must really hate him. Why? Because you don't think he did a good job. And they, they showed me in the scripture that God created me, my inmost being. He knit me just exactly how I needed to be for what the plan was. And at the same time, he loves me. And something clicked. I think that was my first time God just healed that little thing in me. And I was able to say, God, thank you. And we want, I just want you to be able to say thank you. I want to say thank you for some of the things my family has taught me. Maybe not all, but there's something from the things from the past that God will use. Thank you for making me for how I am. Thank you for something that you've given in my past. And I think as you thank him, that there might even be some healing even this morning. As God says, yeah, I was standing beside you when all that was going on. And I was protecting you from some things that you would never know of. I was there. Not only do we want to thank God for his deposits, I just don't waste the deposits that God has put in you. I believe the lies of the evil one use things in your past that make you think that you're disqualified. We're going to look at that next. The very first thing we find out that Moses does as an adult, he goes and kills somebody. <laughs> you think that would disqualify you, right? Man, I can't tell you the number of people who feel like they're disqualified but really being used from God. One of my friends Oh, man, I so looked up to him. Actually, he really helped me along in my whole life journey. And, and he was a, an excellent communicator. He knows the word of God, a great leader. And all of a sudden, something happened. I don't know what happened. His wife left him. And she jumped in bed with a drug dealer. It was weird. It was weird. He tried to get her back, tried to get her back, and then eventually... They split, and then he spent the next, what, 10 years fighting, you know, how the kid thing goes, right? Fighting back and forth. I remember the day he brought me all his Christian books. Dropped them off. So don't give them to me, you know, even though they're books. <laughs> he said, I, I'm done. I'm done with ministry. Don't be done. <laughs> you know, it, it was, it's horrible, and you need to work it through, but you're not done. He said, no, I am done. And so he... He is so gifted. He is so good at what he does. But he, he thinks one thing has disqualified him. And, and God has put deposits in him of gifts and deposits of these, this family around him. And he is like deposited up. But he thinks because of one thing, he is no longer qualified. I'm going to say, if you're in that place... You have deposits in you. Do not waste them. God has put them there. And he still wants to use you in the life of others. He will. He will still want you to serve others. I know it's been hard. It, it's brutal, and you almost are angry at me saying it. But I've seen other people that have been deeply hurt in this very place. And they've walked through those deep waters and still have drawn from that well to help others. And others here have been miraculously helped by people who have been hurt. So thank God for his deposits. And even don't waste any of the deposits, even some of the evil that's been put there, because God can turn it for good. Lastly, uh, parents. I'm going to talk to moms and dads. It's Father's Day, so I've got it half covered. All right. Moms and dads. I believe we need to work along with the Holy Spirit. I believe that we are much of the agent that God decides to put deposits in our kids' lives. Oh, oh, take it as a holy, holy event. 
the things that we are allowed to do. Uh, often in my classes, I've told you this before, but, but often I'll go around the class and say, all right, write down your five top values in your life, five top values, and then write them down. Because every survey in, in, in Canadian teenagers, really the top values still all come from parents. Did you know that? You say, the kids around them, yeah. But still, the, and, and so I go, name your top five values. And I want you to put a little check mark beside it if it happens, those top five values happen to be from your parents. And then they're working away. And I'll go around my class and I'll go, okay, let's start. Just say how many of the top five values are from your parents. And they'll go, we'll go, ready, go. It'll be like this, four, four, five, five, four, four, two, five, four, four. The average comes out to be about 4.3. So in other words, just being with you, four out of the five values your children will pick up. Now, that's the question, though. What are you displaying loudly in their lives? I, I, I remember hearing this and coming face to face with this with my daughter. I'm thinking, wow, I wonder what she thinks my top value is. So I asked her. I said, what do you think mommy and daddy love the most? <laughs> well, mommy loves a clean room. <laughs> And I got really worried. What about me? <laughs> and you want me to do well at school. <laughs> wow. I guess that's it's what I talk about all the time, isn't it? What do you talk about with your kids all the time? What do you whisper as you go? What? Huh. I, I can, can, this needs to be a conversation. If you have a spouse here, if you don't, you just take it on yourself. What values are you going to speak into and display and model? Are you just going to hammer those things again and again? You choose them. You can't put on the whole thing. But maybe there's three or four things that you can do. And listen, if your kids are growing up, you can still do this. You can still get one or two in there. I think it's like this little engine that sits on a conveyor belt. We only have our kids for a little bit, don't we? And we can only put these three, four, and then they're gone. And then they come back. One little thing. Okay. <laughs> let, let me give you some, just to start with, just so you can figure. I think this needs to be conversations. If not, you need to have a conversation with God. Let me suggest one. God can be trusted. Wouldn't that be neat? You know, God can, hey, how you doing? Oh, my schoolwork is all going. You know, God's with you. I'm going to pray for you. Why? Because I can trust God. God can be trusted. Well, Daddy, you don't have a job right now. But it's okay. You know what? We're going to pray because guess what? God can be trusted. <laughs> I'm not going to give any more example. I'm going to get all emotional here. The idea is you pick that and you hammer that, parents. You just hammer it again and again and again. And so you got that thing screwed on tight. Let me try another one. God's got an amazing plan for you. God has an amazing plan for you. Man, I messed up my daughter with that one bad. Just whisper. God has an amazing plan. God, but I don't know what to do. <laughs> you know? My, I, don't, I don't know what the next plan is. No, I know, I believe that God has deposits in you, and he has this amazing plan for you. How about this one? Do the right thing. You will always have the most joy with the right thing. This is going to seem really good. The most joy comes by doing the right thing. You figure it out. You can come out. You're smarter than I am, so you can pick out better things. But sovereign foundations, deposits in our kids' lives. I just want you to strap rockets on those kids. Boom, send them off. Send them off hard, long and, and far. I, my parents strap rockets on me like crazy. Send me off to a Christian camp so maybe they'll figure out how to lead some. They, uh, they asked if I was going to be any good singer. They're going to give me singing lessons, but they told me I couldn't sing, so never mind. <laughs> they just wanted to launch me farther and faster. So, I'm going to ask our worship team to come on up. I'm going to take some time now, and, and this, I love you in the quiet to thank God 
for the deposit he's put in your life? Has, did he save your life from something? Were you in an accident that, I, I don't know, I'll let God do that. We're going to have a time of silence. And then I'm going to ask the same question, what deposits will you leave in this generation? If you're not a mom or dad, guess what? This is why we have Church on the Rock, by the way. We were born out of a youth group. I remember somebody once saying, Dave, someday Church on the Rock is going to grow up. I hope we never do. We're going to get smarter and get all the, the right things screwed on. Can I say, we will love this next generation until I leave this planet. And I'm going to beg you who stay behind me to continue to have Church on the Rock love, keep, and win this next generation. Always, always. Well, what about ministry for the old folks? I tell you, you got it. Look around. Disciple and speak into and love this next generation. This is why we're here. We're here to love these families that have these babies. These teenagers are college students. Man, we are here to put deposits in the next generation. Let's just have some quiet time and let's ask God the questions. Heavenly Father, here's our first question. What deposits did you leave in my life? I, we invite you to speak even now, God, that you would bring things up to mind. And maybe it was a grandparent's prayer. That maybe it was a, a neighbor that helped. Maybe being going to Sunday school when you're young. Father, show us what deposits you left in our lives. Heavenly Father. I now pray, too, for Church on the Rock that you would allow us to leave deposits in this next generation. Give us dreams. Give us energy. Give us the ability to go forward to say this next generation is, is what you want us to capture, to keep, to win, to love, to speak into. I pray that that will happen in the hallways as we pray with each other. I pray that we'll even pray for the little ones as they go by us. I just pray that this will be a church that deposits in the next generation, God. Thank you for listening to our call. In Jesus' name, amen.